Amen. Thank you for that worship this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're taking a little bit of a break from the go- uh, one week uh, break from John's Gospel. We're going to look at Matthew 28 uh, this morning. Um, and I had titled the sermon, Who We Are. Uh, it's probably more should be what we're going to do, uh, because we are going to do what we're going to do because of who we are. Um, but we'll be in Matthew 28 this morning. And as you're turning there, I want you to listen to this. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Listen to those words again. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. That phrase was boldly proclaimed by a man named William Carey in the mid-1700s. William Carey is today known as the father of our modern missions movement, our modern missions organization, Uh, William Carey would leave his home, which was England, in 1793. He would head to India, and he would never go back home. He would stay in India for 40 plus years, and he would be the missionary to the people of India. The statement, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God, comes from the fact that many of the preachers in his day told him he was foolish to go. In fact, one preacher looked at him, and uh, I don't know if I'll get the quote right, but looked at him and said, young man, if God chooses to save the heathen, he'll do so without you. But yet William Carey, who uh, was not educated, did not have a seminary degree, did not have a lot of money, said, I'm going to go expect God to do great things, and I'm going to attempt to do great things for God. The resources that he took to the mission field is love, a desire to bring the light of God into dark places. His strategy was to proclaim by his life, his lips, and his letters the unsearchable Riches of Christ. William Carey was a man who knew who he was, and he was a man who knew what he was supposed to do because of who he was. He knew that he was above being a cobbler, which he worked as a shoe cobbler. Now, you can look that up. I I don't know what that is. I think it fixes shoes. But he was a shoe cobbler. He meddled in a few other things, But ultimately, he knew who he was. First and foremost, he was a disciple. He was a follower of Jesus Christ. And that identity gave him his purpose. I don't know if you've ever struggled with identity, who you are, what you're supposed to do. But oftentimes, when you wrestle with who you are, you're often going to wrestle with what you're supposed to do. To do. And the world has all kinds of things that defines our identity. Some of us are teachers, and that's a good identity. And if you're a teacher, you know your purpose is to teach. Some of you are firefighters, you know what your purpose is, or you're police officers, and you, you know what your purpose is. But those aren't the ultimate things that identify you. The ultimate thing that identifies a Christian is they are a disciple. Disciple means they are a learner. They are learning from Jesus. They are following closely after Jesus. When we first started our series in the Gospel of John, uh, I gave you the illustration, and I've done it several times, that the disciples of Jesus' day, now, now disciples was a term that referred to people who followed Jesus or other rabbis. The idea was a disciple would follow a rabbi so closely that the dust from the rabbi's soul, the rabbi's shoes, would gather on their clothing. They wanted to be that close to their master. They wanted to learn everything from their master that they could. They wanted to be like their teacher. As disciples of Jesus, we need to learn from Jesus. Now listen to me. There's a lot of things we learn in this world. There's a lot of places we learn from in this world. 
You know, we can learn from what we see on the internet, what we see on TikTok or YouTube or Snapchat or, or any of these other social media sites. And by the way, a lot of it's fake. Trust me, I know. The things that tell you how to fix your car, it's fake, it's not right. Those people don't know what they're doing, <laughs> right? But we learn. Some of y'all might do that. Some of y'all know what you're doing. But the people I watch don't know what they're doing. We, there, we can learn from uh, our teachers and, and that's a good place to learn. We learn from what we watch on the news. We learn from uh, the songs that we listen to. The world is throwing information at us at 100 miles, of hour, 100 miles an hour. And we, whether we know it or not, we're consuming that. And whether we know it or not, a lot of that comes out of us. But yet if we are learning from Jesus, that is our primary source of consumption. It doesn't mean we're going to turn the TV off and become hermits and never read the paper or what. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we learn ultimately from Jesus and the Bible. We let this shape our worldview. We let the word of God shape our identity, not the world. We don't let other people tell us who we are supposed to be. We let Jesus show us and teach us who we are are supposed to be. We are his disciples. We learn from him. And listen, some of what he has to say is tough, right? Some of the things he tells us to do is tough. But nevertheless, he is who we get our information from. He is the one that we are to follow closely, so closely that the dust of his sandals gather on our clothes. That is who we are, and William Carey understood who he was. He understood that above everything else, he was a disciple of Jesus. And because he knew exactly who he was, because he learned from Jesus and desired to follow the commands of Jesus, he knew exactly what he was supposed to do. In fact, Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 28 what their primary mission will be now that he is going to the Father. Matthew 28 is filled with the stories of the resurrection. It is filled with a story about the soldiers. But here at the end, as Jesus is with his disciples, resurrected, living, breathing, communicating with them, he says this, starting in verse 16. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped. They worshiped. We're not going to focus on that part this morning, but don't miss it. What did they do when they were in the presence of Jesus? They worshiped. They gathered together as disciples and they worshiped him, their Savior, their Lord. And in that moment of worship, it says that some doubted. Maybe doubting Thomas was there. I mean, think about it. Don't, don't be judgmental. Have you ever seen anybody walking around who's been resurrected? I think we all would have doubted a little bit, right? So don't, don't this is, they're humans. This is all new to them. They're still learning, but they're committed to worshiping and following. So here's what Jesus tells them. Jesus came near in verse 18 and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The disciples knew who they were. And now Jesus has told them what they have to do. William Carey understood this passage. He was pas passionate about this passage. Annie Armstrong was passionate about this passage. William, uh, Taylor Hudson, Lottie Moon, and so many other missionaries that we know of and so many missionaries who will never know their names are passionate about this text of Scripture because they know who they are and they know what they are supposed to do. So I just want to walk through it with you. The first thing that I want you to see is Jesus has all the authority. Jesus has all the authority. You can take all the authority 
under heaven and earth, all the authority that the governments think they have, all the authority that militaries have, all the authority that I think I have or you think you have, Jesus has it all. He is the authority, that, and he has the God-given authority to tell them what he's getting ready to tell them. Now, parents, have you ever experienced, or maybe you're not a parent, maybe you've just done this, experienced this. You've asked somebody to do something. Go clean your room. Go do the dishes. Turn off the TV. Get off that computer. And the immediate response is, why? Anybody ever been there? You can raise your hand. (laughs) Children, students, have you ever asked the question, why? Yes. And, And parents, sometimes we try really hard to come up with reasons. Well, you need to get off the computer because you're going to go blind. <laughs> Hyperbole for sure. Well, I mean, you could. You know, go clean your room. Why? It's a pigsty, right? Go clean your room. Why? Or go, go turn off the TV. Why? Because I want to watch the ball game. You know, sometimes we come up with reasons. Other times we get so far. Now, now in my house, we get multiple whys. Why do you want to watch the ball game? Why does my room look like a pigsty? Why? And then you, you try to answer that. Why? Eventually, we all come to the conclusion and we all say the same things. Children, you've heard this. Because I said so. And I'm the father. I'm the authority. Now, I don't do that with my wife. She does it. I don't do that with her. No, no, no. I have the authority. Jesus is not giving them a chance to say why. He is telling them up front, I got the authority. I'm getting ready to tell you to do something, and before you even ask why, you just need to know, because I said so. Now, Jesus has a reason on why he says so, but Jesus, he says, I'm going to tell you why I'm getting ready to say this. All authority under heaven has been given to me. All authority on earth has been given to me. I am the word. I am the son of God. I'm going to ascend and sit at the right hand of God. All authority has been given to me. That's the reason you need to do what I'm getting ready to tell you to do. And he tells them to make disciples. In our English translations, you would uh, look at this and you might think that the primary verb or the primary command is go. Uh, that's actually a it actually should be going in the Greek. But the primary command, the primary emphasis is make disciples. He looks at the disciples and he says, you guys are disciples. Go make disciples. Remember a couple of weeks ago in John's gospel? And see, all this ties into the series we've been looking at. Jesus looks at the disciples and says, you're going to do greater things than me. You're going to have a global impact with the message that you've received from me. You're going to do so much missions work. And now he's telling them how to do it. He says, make disciples. He's telling them a phrase that I've used since I've been your pastor. Devoted disciples who are committed to making disciples. That is, that's who we are. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a Christian. You are a devoted disciple, a learner of Jesus. And Jesus says, now you have to be committed wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly, wholeheartedly to making other disciples. That's the commandment. That is the commandment for every Christian that has lived since this moment. It is the commission of every single church. We, we know what church is, right? Right? You know, this is a commission for every individual believer to go make disciples. The church is just a gathering of all those believers. We gather together, set apart by God, together, together. The phrase I like to say is we're, uh, we're called out to go out, right? We're a called out people called to go out and find people and to make people and to witness to people. And so if that's the primary idea is make disciples. How do we do it? The first thing is we go. If you want to make disciples, you're going to have to go. We shouldn't question whether or not we should go. We shouldn't ask whether or not we should go. The question should be, where should we go? Where should we go? William Taylor or William Carey said, I'm going to India. Lottie Moon, I'm going to China. Annie Armstrong, I'm going to do stuff in North America. Church planners, I'm going to do stuff in the city I was born and raised. 
So yeah, when we think of this passage, we think of international missions, but we shouldn't get lost in that because Jesus in in the uh, book of Acts, Luke tells us the Great Commission a little bit differently, but Luke tells us that Jesus says, you will be my witness in Jerusalem, their city, Judea, their nation, their state, their region, Samaria, another nation, another people's group, and to the ends of the earth. So we go to all of those places to make disciples. You can go to the beauty shop and make disciples. You can go to the barber shop and make disciples. You can can go to a ball game and make disciples. You can go to a restaurant and make disciples. uh, A young man who uh, I used to eat lunch with a lot, he had this thing. Every time we went to eat lunch, he would always, this is how he would start. The waiter or waitress, and he would say, how can I pray for you? How can I? Pr- some ignored it. Some, in, but that was a lot, sometimes it was a door to tell them about Jesus. That was his way of going, make and making disciples. It is not an option for us to be people who go. We are called to go. We are commanded to go. Go right next door to your neighbor. Go right across the street. I've been standing here, what, 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes preaching. I've seen four people walk by this church walking their dogs. Those are our neighbors. We have to go to the people. God planted this church here. God called you here. And and if you've been visiting or if you're new or checking this church out, this is a message. I want you to see this is who we are and this is what we're going to do. And we'd love for you to be a part of it if God calls you to be a part of it. But we're going to be a people. We have to be a people that go. The second thing he says, we go, and then if we want to make disciples, we baptize. This is important. This means we evangelize. This means we tell people about Jesus. We proclaim the gospel. We baptize them, and that's immersion. That's being dipped and being brought back up. And baptism does not save people. Baptism is a symbol of what is taking place. It's an outward symbol of an inward reality. When we are put into the water, we die to our old self. And when we are lifted up, we are given a new life in Christ. It's a symbol of that. Our sins have been washed away. This happens after we make a decision to follow. You may be here today and you say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to get forgiveness for my sins. I want to be saved and surrender my life to him. The next step is to go public and to be baptized. For me, that was hard. I was a Methodist. That, this was hard for me. I had to really study this and pray about this. And I've come to understand what baptism really is. It's about declaring that you are a Christian, declaring that you are a follower. And as we go make disciples, we have to tell people about that. We have to tell people about Jesus. We have to proclaim that he forgives sins. Like, like the lady in the video They found some ways to start those conversations. And the one thing God never gives, Jesus never gives up on people. That's the message we have to tell people when we're baptizing them or we're going to tell them about and evangelizing to them and telling them about Jesus. God doesn't give up on you. It doesn't matter how sinful you are or how far you've strayed. There is forgiveness. It doesn't matter how bad that addiction is. It doesn't matter how much you struggle, there is forgiveness in Jesus. And you, once you decide to follow Jesus, you can't stay there. But listen, he forgives sins. That's the message we tell people. We make disciples by going, we make disciples by baptizing, and then we make disciples by teaching. This may or may not be a very popular statement, but I think one of the most harmful things that the church has ever done has failed to teach and disciple new converts. Now, I love Billy Graham, and I think those crusades were the greatest awakening of my generation and maybe your generation, and I believe in my heart people were saved. Not many people were discipled. Not many people were connected with a local church where the church taught them, lived life with them. Not many of those people plugged into Sunday school classes. Many did. But my point is, we are not called to make converts. We are called to make disciples. 
if this altar fills up with a hundred people who want to be saved and we never see them again after today, we have failed at making disciples. We have failed at teaching them. I don't, you know this. The Christian life isn't easy. Reading, reading this book is hard. Understanding what it means and then applying it to your life is hard. We have to teach people. We can't just say a prayer with them, dunk them in water, and let them go. We have to love them and teach them. And by the way, that shows us how to be devoted disciples. We have to learn it ourselves. We can't teach people what we don't know. We have to be committed. Last week, we, we talked about this a lot. You know, for us as a church right now, our growth ministry, where we want you plugged in, growing closer to Christ, is through our Sunday school program, through those small groups that meet on Sunday mornings and one that meets on Monday. That's where we dive deep and we grow, where we learn and we become closer to Jesus. That's the place that if you're a new Christian, we want you plugged in to those areas of growing. We gather on Sunday mornings to worship like the disciples gathered here to worship on the mountain, but then we want you to grow because we need to learn ourselves so that we can teach others. Danny Aiken puts it this way. Baptism is preschool enrollment into, into a school of learning that you never graduate from until you die. Baptism is simply preschool enrollment into a school of learning that you never graduate from until you are in heaven. When we say we're going to make disciples, we have to understand new Christians are preschoolers. The book of Hebrews talks about they have to drink milk before they eat meat. We have to walk with them each and every step of the way, loving on them, caring for them, supporting for them, and teaching them. Now, when we think about global missions, and maybe you're thinking about knocking on your neighbor's door, it seems like an overwhelming, scary, impossible task. 11, 11 guys were just told they're going to go make disciples of all the nations. And here's how Jesus ends it. He says, and remember, guys, remember, buddies, remember, Followers, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus bookends this commission with two very important things. He's got the authority, and he's always with us. When the task of going seems impossible, he is with us. What did we talk about a couple weeks ago in John? He's going to send a helper. He has sent the helper, the Holy Spirit, to empower us and to embolden us and to encourage us. And when you have conversations with people that seem smarter than you and they're asking questions that you don't have the answer to, well, it's okay to say, I don't know. But remember, Jesus is with you. If you go overseas, and I've been to some really bad places, I've been in really scary circumstances, but Jesus is always with us. I, I think the scariest thing I've ever experienced is walking out of an airport in Honduras followed by two military, two Honduran soldiers with these really big guns. They followed us through the whole airport and followed us out of the airport. We actually started taking selfies. Uh, we didn't know what they were doing. And as we got in the missionary's car, they stood right there, as close as they could get without getting run over. That's scary. They wouldn't have done anything, probably. But in the moment we got in, the missionary said, hey, Jesus is with you. And I remember one of the other young men in the group goes, yeah, but the guns are with them. <laughs> but Jesus is with us. That's what teenagers say, right? Yeah. Jesus is with us. So my question for us is what are we doing to make disciples? And we are gathering to worship. We have a great worship service. I love seeing everyone here every Sunday. We grow through our Sunday school. 
And it's a great Sunday school ministry. We have great classes, great teachers. You can always use more teachers if you feel led to be that. But how are we going to go? How are we going to make disciples? So I wanted to share this message, and I wanted to share this with you in the context of what we're starting tonight. I've talked to our students and our parents the last couple weeks. I talked to the Sunday night crowd last week. Uh, We've talked to the deacons about this, and these are just some practical action steps. Our children and the ministry that they have been doing on Sunday night has honestly set the example for us on how we go. The children in action, the mission friends, what they have been doing in educating our children and then the little mission projects and bigger mission projects that they have done have set the example. Paul tells Timothy, don't let them look down on you because you're young, set the example. And our children have set the example. And as I was praying through kind of our purpose for Sunday night, it hit me that our youth need to be doing missions. So tonight our youth will begin the same process, pathway that our children are on, and they are going to be educated in missions. They're going to be uh, talking about projects and things that they can do to serve the community, uh, ways that we can go and be uh, evangelizing and baptizing and teaching and going. Uh, Our student ministry will become very missional, and Sunday night will be the time where we do that. And then our adults, we want you to follow suit and be missional as well. So our Sunday night programming or uh, process uh, is going to change drastically, but be the same in some ways. But we want all of our adults to be a part of this, where you will also have some missions education. You will learn about the same missionaries our children are learning about and our youth are learning about. Tonight, we're in New Mexico. So you'll spend some time doing that. But then adults will start slow. Tonight, we'll have you doing some birthday cards and sending out some things to some of our members. That will expand over time. Uh, The long-term vision is prayer walking this community, uh, finding projects to serve our first responders, law enforcement, firefighters, doctors, nurses, and so many others. The idea is this. Jesus told us to go make disciples. He told us to do it. He's told us to care for each other, to care for the people who aren't here. We have to be intentional about doing that. Um, We have to be intentional with the ways we do it. Now, again, we'll take slow steps, but we will expect great things from God as we move in this direction, and we will attempt great things for God. Uh, And I'll be honest, if it leads to this sanctuary being filled up, that'll be fantastic. But above that, if it leads to souls being saved, it doesn't matter what church they go to. We'll worship together with them in heaven and we'll celebrate their decision. But as the, church, the first Baptist church of China Grove, we are going to make disciples. And we're going to start here. And then we'll talk about and pray about where to go next. That is who we are. Disciples, and that is what we will do. Make disciples. Uh, my motivation, my challenge to you is to come and be a part of it. Uh, Come be a part of it. You may not be able to be here every Sunday, Sunday night, that's fine. There's other ways that you can get involved. We don't have to limit it to just one night. But this is where we'll start. We will be devoted disciples, committed to making disciples. But here's my last question for this morning. Are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you acknowledged that you are sinful, that you make mistakes, that you're running away from God as fast as you can? And if that's you and you're running and you're running and you're running, I want you to know something. Jesus is right on your heels. And when you turn around to repent... He'll be right there to forgive you and embrace you. There's nothing that you've ever done that he won't forgive. There's nothing we'll ever do that he won't forgive. So are you a disciple? Church, we have our action steps with our missions programming for on Sunday nights. But the action step for the non-believer is to come down, 
and surrender your life to the Lord. Or stay in your seat and surrender your life to Jesus. To repent, turn from this world, stop learning from this world, and learn from our Savior. I'll stand down at the altar as we do this invitation. I'd love to pray with you. If you're visiting and would like to join this church and come and be a part of it, we invite you to do that. Again, I'll be down here. And if you're ready to make the decision to follow Jesus, I'll be here to pray with you as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for giving us our identity. We thank you for clearly showing us who we are, that our our identity, who we are, is in you. We are your children. If we believe in you, we repent. You forgive us, Father. That's who we are. But Father, we have a job. We have a mission. And if we're going to do greater things and have a global impact, then we need to heed the words to make disciples. Father, we know it's hard. We know it's challenging. We know William Carey spent seven years in India before one person was baptized and saved. But he never lost sight of your faithfulness, of your power, of your love for him and the people of India. He never quit. Father, I pray that would be us, that we would never quit. Living for you, learning about you, growing closer to you, worshiping you. And that we would never quit making disciples for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.